bay, um, you um, rip the engine out and then you put a motor onto the gearbox with a special adapter plate. And that's the bit that I, one of those things that I had to get made. Um, because you've got to have room for the, the motor and possibly an extension shaft on the end. Sometimes they have an auxiliary shaft where you can run a taco or you can run an uh, air conditioner, um, whatever on the end. <coughs> of course the motor has to be powerful enough to push the car along. There's no good having uh, a little motor in there that's just going to sort of chug along and burn itself out as soon as you put your foot on the accelerator. So you've got to have a motor that's at least big enough to um, push the car along at about the normal speed that it used to be go at when it was a petrol car. After looking around at motors and uh, looking at different dimensions as well, there was, a, there's a, there was a f two or three different models available back in 2008. Uh, in the in the DC realm, and uh, I ended up choosing the ADC X91 4001, and uh, I ended up with about 30 millimeters of space at the end of the motor where uh, where the firewall uh, ended up. It weighed 37 kilograms, 20 kilograms lighter than the engine that I took out, which was good. And I thought the engine was going to be heavier than that, you know that was only 57 kilograms. I thought, oh, didn't, I thought it was going to save a lot more weight, but I ended up only saving 20 kilograms. So, and the peak power of the motor is about the same as the original engine. Um, motors are rated at um, uh, sort of average power for, for an hour. Um, the peak power is uh, usually about three or four times more than the than the nominal power of an electric motor. So uh, the peak just happened to be around about uh, the same as the original engine specification. Here we see the electric motor on to, on mounted onto an adapter plate, which is mounted onto the gearbox. That's the picture of it just being lowered into the car on the hoist. <coughs> okay, now we've got to choose the battery. So what choices did I, did I have? Lead acid or lithium? <laughs> Lead acid are heavy. They don't last very long. Need to be mounted in a vented box with fans on the input and fans on the output. To shove all the gases through to the outside of the car but they're cheaper. Lithium ion are a lot lighter, about a third of the weight. They last longer, they've actually got a higher energy density, um, but they don't need to be vented, they don't need to be put into boxes because they don't normally vent uh, any gases in, in normal use. If you short circuit one, they gas a little bit. Yeah, looking back at um, after my decision was, was good because other people at the same time were putting lead acid into cars and um, within 18 months they actually took them out and put lithium in and then they had to rebuild their battery boxes a lot of the time. And the battery box is one of the, you know, one of the biggest construction things in the, in the car um, and one of the most important too, the one that's checked by Regency to make sure it's bolted down to stand up to all the g-forces when you have a, an accident. Yeah, the next question was how many cells and what size battery? Um, the, from the motor specs, the voltage to the motor has to be between 72 and 144 volts, somewhere in that range. It's, an, it's normally a 120 volt motor. Um, so if you look at Ohm's law, um, I equals E over R and P, which is power, equals I times E, which is the voltage. And um, so the, the higher the voltage for the, same, for the same power, the higher the voltage, the lower the current can be. Okay, so um, if you want to make your batteries last longer, long time, you make sure the current coming out of them is, is as low as possible. So that means you want to have as high a voltage as possible. For the same power. <coughs> uh, 
and then there's the physical side. You've got to make sure they're going to fit in the car. So where where I fitted the batteries, I actually removed the back seat and um, made a battery frame to fit exactly where the back seat was, and that fitted it sort of down in a little hollow in the back there, uh, very nicely. And um, by measuring it all up prior to making the battery frame. Um, working out the number of cells and the different sizes of cells available, um, it worked out that I could have um, 40, fit 42 cells in the car. Um, no, we got back seat, place the batteries. Yeah, and I still wanted to keep plenty of space for st you know, draw and taking stuff in the back of the car as well, like tonight. Brought all the gear tonight, probably about 100 k's of it. Uh, the weight of the battery pack is also very important. With, as with any car, there's a GVM figure that you're not supposed to go over. In this case, it was, the, it was a little uh, hatchback car, so the, they had quite a good uh, GVM on it. They were expecting you to carry some stuff in the back, obviously. And um, all the figures are there, but to, you have to sort of add uh, the, the, the curb weight of the car, and then you've got to add 81.6 kilograms for each person, which includes their luggage. So um, I actually ripped out the back seat, so I saved three, three people there, so that was good. It's now re actually registered as a two-seater. Um, yeah, so in the end, I, after all those calculations, I had uh, 362 kilograms available for batteries and, and so forth. Um, yeah, that, that I actually mentioned most of this before. Uh, Thunder Sky ones were the, were the best value for money and I ended up using the 90 ampere hour ones. Uh, 42 of those would fit nicely in three rows across behind the front seat. I didn't end up using 42, I ended up actually using 40 because um, to get the cables neatly out of the uh, battery frame I left two, two in the middle out so I actually had 40 cells. and. Um, the cables actually disappear. I've got two little fake cells which have got the corners cut off where the cables go out into, the, into a little box right behind the battery frame where there's a uh, circuit breaker as well. That left me with 40 cells and the equivalent of 128 volts. Nominal. Which was pretty perfect. That shows the battery frame with all the cells in it there. Um, You can see at the back there where the cables disappear through the, through the back with there's two um, fake cells. They just I painted some wooden blocks yellow, and they're hollow wooden blocks, so they're not too heavy. And uh, yeah, they disappear through the back, and there's a box at the back there where they where the cables terminate in, with a circuit breaker and also the uh, shunt for the metering. And all this battery frame we had to be approved by um, an engineer and particularly diagonals and I, I sent him a pencil sketch of this battery frame and he said yeah that's okay as long as you put some diagonals in it. So I had to add, add these diagonals to this thing all over, the, all over the place and then he approved it so that was good and also holding the cells down uh, I had to put these uh, angles across here with a little plastic block. Um, at underneath uh, holding the corners of four cells down uh, and that was approved as well thank, thankfully. I've got a the main pack is charged here with an Italian Zivan charger 33 kilowatt charger and then a 12 volt battery in the front of the car you see, which you'll see later is charged by this little PowerTech um, charger here. So both of those get powered up when, you, when I plug in each night so that make sure the batteries are all topped up. Actually it's good having having that option is, is good because at one stage my DC-DC converter failed and so for a few days I didn't have a DC-DC converter so luckily when I plugged it in each night the 12 volt battery got charged up again. So it'll, it'll run all day um, uh, with, without being charged without being charged by the DC-DC converter. What do we got here? 40. Oh yeah, the 40 cells weighed 120 kilograms, 
um, a lot less than the 362 which is available so that's good well within the uh, GVM once it's all added up so the car started out at 740 kilograms as a petrol car and, and now it's 820 kilograms so we just added 80 kilograms to it okay how does the motor drive the wheels front wheel drive car the differential is in the gearbox so it's good to leave the gearbox in the car and mount the electric motor onto this this way you can select the appropriate forward gears and also have reverse available uh, if you've got a rear wheel drive car like Edwards you can actually put the motor straight onto the diff uh, without a gearbox and then make sure you've got very big batteries to back that up because the currents are going to be very high Uh, this is the adapter plate made by um, Hammett Precision Engineering. Turned out of one piece of steel. There's a, actually a video on YouTube um, off my website. You can see that and you can actually see it being turned on the lathe. And then once it was finished on the lathe, he just simply, um, oh, he, he machined some of these nice little bits around here uh, just to touch it up, make it sort of look a bit better and get rid of some metal that wasn't needed because it is steel and still fairly heavy and then that's the outside of the holding the motor on but now you've got to connect the motor drive into the gearbox so this is done with a coupler um, this is turned out of steel as well and I used the center of the clutch plate the main reason for that was to get the splines from the clutch plate to align with the input shaft of the gearbox and you can see that there the splines in the center there that just slides onto the input shaft of the gearbox so you, there's no problem of coupling that way and also the springs are still in use uh, so they take up a little bit of the torque as you as it, as it engages each time just to give it a little bit of flexibility okay now how does the uh, drive get to the motor how do the batteries connect to the motor we've got a DC motor so we, know, so we need a DC controller um, DC controllers use pulse width modulation PWM we have had a, a, a talk on PWM before but it's simply just um, uh, chopping the DC up into a pulse, a pulse stream and that's what it looks like so that the, the top graph shows the, when the car is going at a very slow rate you, you can see the positive pulses are very narrow so the average voltage is very low the uh, third one down is actually 50% duty cycle so there's the same size positive end zero pulses which gives you half speed that'll give you half speed and the bottom one is 90 percent duty cycle so it's mostly on so you're going very very fast with that one so basically that's how the controller works now to change from that through to that to that is done via that so you've got a, a hall effect um, pot box as they used as they call it a potentiometer box they were and they used to have a re rear stat in there and uh, what the, the, and the, the carbon used to get worn out and, you, and your car used to jerk all over the place so now they're putting a Hall effect device in there which has got no moving parts except the magnet which which just moves across the top of the Hall effect device which is a little three pin looks like a three pin transistor and um, that puts out a varying voltage and the, and the varying voltage normally 0 to 5 volts and the 0 to 5 volt signal goes out via this lead, black lead here to the controller and uh, the controller accepts that signal and says okay if you've only got a very small, volt, small voltage I'm going to make the car go very slow if you've got close to 5 volts it's going to go very fast it's basically that, that's how it works um, now the controller I first started using was the Kelly controller and they're supposed to be a 500 um, amp controller it ended up being more like 250 amps it was just so slow it was embarrassing um, you, you'd take off from the lights and there'd be people sort of pushing you 
along. <laughs> you couldn't, couldn't keep up with normal traffic, so that came out very, very quickly. Um, at the time, there wasn't a real lot around. The, the, the Kelly was one of the, one of the ones. The other one was the Curtis uh, controller. And I didn't want to put a Curtis in because they make too much noise when, when you're going slow. So I didn't, didn't like that sort of sound all the time. Um, so d about that time, um, um, Ian Hooper in, per in, in Western Australia was making his Ziva uh, MC600S. And um, I got one of the first ones that he made, I think mine's number 10 or something. It's got a little sticker on it, number 10. And that actually does put out 600 amps peak. Um, I think probably more like 250 amps continuous. But the car keeps up with traffic and actually can, can really sort of beat traffic now more than, more than it, uh, probably more than it used to as a petrol car. Okay, so we've talked about that pot box. So the cable from the from the um, accelerator pedal just connects to that little arm there. So I've, I've actually used the same accelerator cable, I haven't touched that at all, and just mounted this pot box in a position where the cable reached just nicely so that it actually pulled against that thing there. And you normally put it, there's a spring in here for return, there's also a spring on the accelerator in the in the car, and you put another spring on here to a bracket over here, or well, no, be this side, so um, so that you, when they look at it at Regency, they see oh yes, you've got return springs there. They don't actually know there's one in the middle, so you make sure there's another one on there just to keep them happy. Um, Yeah, connecting, connecting all the bits together. This is the, the tricky bit for those that, people that sort of haven't done any electronics. Um, it's not real difficult. Um, normally when you buy a, a motor, there's a, a schematic that comes with the, from the supplier showing you how to connect it all up. And as long as you can sort of follow wires and understand what a positive sign is and what a negative sign is, that's probably one of the most important things. And also to be able to use a multimeter. I mean, you don't have to have an expensive multimeter um, as long as you've got volts, ohms, and a continuity meter. Does anyone know what what I mean by continuity? When you touch the leads together, it beeps at you. Very handy. Make sure if you buy a multimeter, make sure it's got a continuity um, setting on it. Often it comes with a with a diode check. So sometimes it, you can do either diode or continuity on the one setting. But um, we will probably have a, a, we're trying to organise a special um, day, one day, to have a training session on electronic, electrics and electronics, uh, which would be really good for those people that are not sort of up with all that. Okay, where's everything fit? Well, there we go. Motor and controller. DC DC converter, 12 volt batteries in the same spot as it used to be. It's actually a um, uh, not a gel cell. It's a sealed, a sealed lead acid battery, SLA lead acid battery in the place of the original battery. Um, high current cables. It's like um, there's the like a sample of the cable on the table over there. 50 millimeter squared um, copper cables. Very very flexible. Um, they actually come from the front of the battery box that I, where I showed those cables going out into the into the uh, circuit breaker box through the via the shunt. They go under the car, and then they come up behind the firewall just behind here. And I haven't got an arrow to it, but that's the main contactor there, which supplies the um, high voltage through to all this all this stuff in the front. Uh, miscellaneous control circuitry that I've built myself. Um, and the heater, no, I've got another one for that. Uh, heater control here with the switching for it there. I used a ceramic element inside the water jacket of the heat, the old heater that was in the car. Cut a hole in that and put a, a ceramic element from a heater bought for, from an American 
fan heater, which is 120 volts over there. So there's a, there's a guy on the net now that's actually just taking the heaters out of Walmart heaters and selling the, just the heater element to us guys here in Australia and New Zealand after I told him to do that. Uh, the electric motor is just under here and the gearbox of course is still under here. Uh, under, under, just down here a little bit further there's an electric vacuum pump for the power brakes because uh, of course you've got no vacuum now, there's no engine so you've got to produce the vacuum some other way for the power brakes. Luckily this car hasn't got power steering so I didn't have to reproduce the power steering drive. But that's basically it. Um, in the front, all the wiring of course, anything that's um, got orange on it is like you don't touch it. You, where, the, where they terminate you just don't touch that because it's high voltage so it's all sheathed with um, orange heat, heat shrink just to keep it safe. There we go, any questions? Yes. How close did you get to the GVM? 125. I think I still had 100 and um, no, I had about 200, 200 kilograms free. Oh, yeah. Three Did you eight, eight, eight? No, I had so I had 300 and something to play with, and I added, added 120 kilograms worth of batteries, so 250 or something like that. Yes. Eric, uh, I'm wondering why you didn't make the end plate of alloy, because it is. Yes, that's a good question. Why I didn't, didn't I make the uh, adapter plate out of alloy? Um, number one, the, the guy that makes, uh, made it for me, Ray Hammett from Hammett Precision Engineering, he likes using steel. It's a lot easier to um, work in the lathe than aluminium and if it was aluminium it would have been had to be thicker and I think that would have probably run out of space yeah because um, yeah, it, it, it only ended up like half inch thick and I think a lot of aluminium ones are sort of more like an inch thick and I might have been too close to the side wall of the engine bay with the auxiliary shaft yeah. What's the range Jerry? Oh yeah, the range is in the summertime. It's about 80 kilometres. In the, in the winter, it's about 65. The batteries go a little bit sluggish in the cold weather. They like to be warm. But uh, it's still after I've been driving it for five years, and it's still got the same same range. So it hasn't deteriorated at all mm -hmm. that I've noticed. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Eric. What's the rules about uh, reducing the weight in the engine bay? They've got some rules that you're not allowed to reduce it by more than 50 kilos or whatever. No, um, you have to supply a weight certificate with the front weight, the rear weight and the total weight. Um, I did that. In actual fact, um, the car is actually a little bit heavier at the front than it was before. The reason for that is because I added, when I, where I put the batteries between the, the axles, the weight is distributed between the front and the rear axle. It's more, now as an electric car, it's actually more even, a little bit more even, but it's still heavier at the front than the back. So they, they didn't care at all. It's, they, they thought it was good, but I, I don't know. If, I think if you had a drastic change. 10%. 10%? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. within 10% of the original weight distribution, wow. they tend to take a okay. turn of line on. 10%. Try and keep it within 10%. Yeah, <coughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Eric, did you use some sort of battery management? Yes, I didn't mention that, did I? Um, there's a, a lot of things I left out of this presentation because it's just so much stuff to put in it. Um, with the batteries just go back to the battery picture okay um, each cell so there's 40 cells each cell has got a BMS module on it and they're all the output of the each module 
is attached to the output of the next to the next to the next. There's a big loop running around all of the 40 modules and the loop goes back to a um, master unit and then the master unit uh, controls two things. Uh, basically the little BMS battery management system units, BMS modules monitor the voltage of the battery when it goes low and it monitors the battery when it comes high. So if, when you're driving, if, if battery go, battery, any battery, any cell goes below 2.5, um, 2.6 volts, something like that, it causes that loop to break. And then the, the master unit sees that break and gives an alarm in the form of a buzzer in my case you can actually have it control your controller and make the car crawl along in uh, turtle mode if you wanted to. Uh, mine just gives a buzzer. Uh, in those five years I have never heard that buzzer. I have tested it every now and again just to make sure it still works by opening up the loop <coughs> but uh, we're no, none of the cells have been down to two, around 2.6 volts during that whole five years. Um, the other thing it does is when you're charging the car it then monitors the high voltage for each cell. So when the cell gets to 4.1 volts, it opens the loop again, and then the, the master controller knows that it was been charging, and it says, okay, turn off the charger. So it actually disconnects the charger from the mains. It, in my case, it's actually a, a high voltage, a 240 volt relay, and it actually opens up the charge. Um, that doesn't that that hasn't happened for five, five, five years because my batteries are now perfectly balanced and none of the cells ever reach anywhere near 4.1 volts so my bms modules are not doing a lot of work the, the one good thing is when when it's in the normal mode you get a little green light on each cell so you you know that each cell is within the range of 2.7 2.7 and 4.1 if uh, the other thing the, the modules do is on at the end of the charge at around about 3.6 volts there's a, a resistor or a load on, in each of the modules individually on each cell so that when that cell reaches 3.6 volts it starts to conduct and starts bypassing the charge to that cell so in actual fact at the end of the charge and, and a red light comes on to show that's happening so at the end of the charge, all the red lights are glowing. So you've got green and red all, gl all glowing. So it's a it's, um, really nice thing to see. All nicely balanced. Yeah, so I'm sorry I didn't mention that before, but yeah, so each of those little ones there. And they're worth about like $13, $13, $14 or something each um, from EV Works in Western Australia. So, uh, sorry, EV Power in Western, in Western Australia. Any other questions? Yes? If, if one cell does actually die on it as you're driving along, yep. can you, you said it, it puts you into a crawl mode perhaps, can you just bypass that cell or drop your overall voltage? In actual fact, when they go, when they go faulty, um, they, it doesn't seem to interrupt the, the current. It just dr often drives it into reverse or whatever if the cell goes faulty. And, and starts making the cell hot. There was a gentleman the other day put a, a video on YouTube. One of his cells was actually hissing at him when he got back after a long trip. And he put his voltmeter across and it was about 0.4 of a volt. And it was obviously had it. But he knew this cell was, a, was slightly faulty because it had bulged before. But in that case, the, the current was still being forced through that cell and it still allowed him to drive it at, at, still, at very high speeds still. Um, and he, yeah, he would have lost um, a couple of volts, yeah, for sure, but it didn't seem to interrupt the the current. <laughs> but it just wrecked the wrecked the battery completely, and he didn't have any BMS on there. So if he had a, had a BMS module on each cell, he would have got an alarm when that one went faulty. But a lot of the guys in America don't seem to put BMS on for some reason. I don't know why. They're all listening all listening to Jack Jack Rickard from EVTV. Yes. <coughs> If you're driving and the alarm went on, what would you do? Oh yeah, if the alarm comes on when you're driving, you basically pull over um, and stop 
Um, if the alarm comes on, if you're climbing a very steep hill and you're at the, nearly at the end of your range, um, you can probably continue up the hill as long as there's not too much more further to go. And, and if you go over the top of the hill, the alarm will probably stop because the, the battery will just come back up above that limit and you can continue to drive. Um, if the alarm stays on, you, you have to pull over. So it, can you uh, bypass that still? Not, not readily unless you've got um, spanners and things to actually dis disconnect it and, and put a little link from the cells around it. You'd have to have a toolkit and have all that ready to go. But um, what normally you would do if you're driving and it comes on, what I would do is basically um, I'd pull over and, and if it if it keeps going, even when you stop, it's really bit really bad. But if you slow down and it's and the, and the alarm goes off, you could continue to drive at a really really slow speed if you're close to home and just crawl because when you're crawling your current in my car particularly is can be around about like five or six amps if you just crawl along the side of the road but in, the, in when you're driving at 50 k's it might be 60 amps so there's a big difference between driving fast and driving slow so you could crawl home as long as the alarm didn't come back on so then you're and then when you get home then you've got to find out which cell it was and <coughs> yeah. And, and replace it. P possibly, yeah. If if all the others are still, you know, got high voltage on them, and and it's not near the end of the range of the car, yeah, yeah that faulty, that cell's faulty. Yeah. So is it okay to put a new one in uh, among others that are? Uh, you can. But you've got to make sure it's at the same state yeah. state of charge, which is really really difficult. I mean, you could just make sure you charged up the. The, the rest of the pack uh, best you, as best you can and then charge that cell individually on a, on a power supply and then put it in the pack. It should be fine. Eric, the, uh, my, uh, I've got a, a one of the uh, EV uh, power uh, BMSs and mine, mine shuts the controller off. It's, it's, it's part of the it's part of the safety loop that that goes through the yep. inertia switch and everything. So so when mine went down, I, my car just stopped. Yep. Um, and uh, but I found that if I was just standing on the roadside for a few minutes, the battery recovered slightly, and I was able to go forward just far enough to find a farmhouse and knock on the door and say, <coughs> "Excuse me, um, can I borrow some electricity?" Getting a rather strange look, but um, I did. Yeah, by disabling the, the controller, is, that's the safest thing to do for the batteries, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. and if you if you take it down too low, I, I went, play funny buggers, and not knowing what which one it was, I thought, well, I'll find out by driving around at home until I, I get it, till I stop, and I'll put the multimeter on. Unfortunately, doing that the second time got me down to the point where the battery wouldn't, that cell wouldn't take charge, mm. and I had to recover it over many hours with a phone charger and that's the only way you can bring them back day because once you once they're below um, the recovery voltage the these smart chargers um, that are designed to charge them won't put power into them they ju it just says oh no this battery's fine and switches off so you there'd be a, an ordinary mobile phone charger if you've got an old Nokia in the cupboard that's fine just pull a little tit off the end and put a couple of alligator clips and then just be prepared to spend an hour and a half well it just trickles it up above the critical voltage and then you can uh, and then a little single cell charger which you can borrow from people like me and you can just bring that that cell back up it shouldn't happen but uh, occasionally they just for some unknown reason one of them will go out of out of um, state of charge with the rest you know. hmm. Luckily, mine haven't. You can't always get another one like it because mine, mine are now irreplaceable. So if one of mine goes down, I'm going to replace the entire pack. So, so we should you uh, uh, buy a few extras at the same time? Yes, a lot of people do buy a couple of extras. Yeah, the trouble is they're so expensive. 
even the, uh, I think the, my 90 amp hours are about $150 each or something, something like that. And the 40 ampere hour ones I bought for the Prius, they were about $60 each. So. You, you didn't say why you chose 90s as opposed to 100s or 140s or 180s. Why well, the, I could have had um, 100 uh, ampere hour Sky Energy, but they were a bigger cell, and they were, I, would, I wouldn't have fit. They wouldn't have fitted. It was so, they're so critical. This width of this thing, if you have a look at it, it's just so critical with the size of the back, where the back seat was and the, where the doors are. Um, it, it, you couldn't have couldn't fit anything bigger in because the hundred ampere hours were just slightly wider. Higher would have been okay, but the width was the the, the killer. A lot of people use the Sky Energy ones at the same time. They're the blue ones. Yep. Um, can Marianne and Trevor use those? Yeah. You having any trouble with your Sky Energies? No? no? Another question? Yep. Eric, you use some red or black wires with the orange corrugation on it. Is that acceptable to the red car? Uh, if you if you use, if you read the regulations uh, of the South Australian um, regulatory mob motor vehicles mob, um, they use the words like should. So um, I don't think they use the word must very much yeah, at all. They, they ignore it because I, when I asked them, I, I used um, green and yellow stripe cable. <laughs> Um, <laughs> on the basis that if anyone who puts their bolt cutters through a, uh, a cable as thick as their thumb shouldn't be on the planet. But they, uh, they, uh, I, I said, look, I'll go use green and yellow cables, not orange. And they said, we don't care. It's, it's not mandated. If it's not yeah. mandated, we're not interested. So they didn't even give it a second look. My personal opinion is, yes, you should use orange. Or if you use red and black, where the wires come out of the conduits, you cover them with orange heat shrink, which is readily available. So they become orange wires. That's what I did with the Prius. All, I used some oddball like red and blue cables in the Prius, but I covered with them with orange heat shrink, so they appear like orange cables. That's the one way to one way to do it. Yep. Um, how far to the front radio is that? Are we allowed to put our electric vehicle um, Yeah, when you talk to the engineer, the engineer will dis dissuade you from putting batteries there. Um, anything else, it probably doesn't matter a real lot. You can put, put things right up against it. Um, yeah, you just can't put batteries right at the front. You get crushed. You shouldn't. <laughs> yes? Would you do another one use AC? Yes, my, my next conversion is going to be AC. When I say next, uh, when someone buys this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I li I'd like to have regen on it. Um, if it works properly. Yeah, I won't be buying the Chinese one, that's for sure. <laughs> no, I think the, the AC is good. You've got no brushes. I, had, I did have a problem with my brushes in my electric motor. And, uh, they wore out prematurely, and uh, I'm, That's yeah, I know. I think I've done nearly the same amount of kilometres now since I've changed them as, as I had done before, and there's no no wear at all shown. So. Yeah, I took the um, the clutch out of mine because uh, the took the torque of the motor was destroying the clutch, the <laughs> new clutch plate, and so I just did away with it and put a solid connector in. And uh, while it was out, I thought I, from your experience, I thought I'll have a look. And uh, my brushes are barely worn, mm. and I've done 35, 36,000 kilometres. Yeah, I'm not sure whether my brushes might not have been worn in from the, from new. Some some of the motors come with the brushes just square, and you have to run them in so to wear them in basically. So what I did with my new brushes, I actually um, put them on on a 12, put the motor on a 12 volt battery, and just ran it <coughs> uh, continuously for. 270 hours and uh, wore the gradually wore the, the brushes in even though the when I got the brushes made in Queensland I actually told them the diameter of the um,
commutator and of course the, the brushes don't sit squarely against the commutator in their little holders so it still had to wear, wear a little bit away to, to make it uh, flush with the commutator. And it took 270 hours. The equivalent, equivalent of over 9,000 kilometres at 35 k's an hour. Continuous. Yes? Is charging very economical? Is charging? Economical. economical? Yes. Is charging very economical if you're using J-tariff <laughs> off-peak? Yeah. 40. Oh, solar panels? Yeah. And how much do you think you'll... Uh, a full charge on my on this car is a dollar seventy-five. Yeah. Full charge on the Prius is about a dollar fourteen. On GTO? Sorry? On GTO? Yeah. Can you connect? Fourteen cents. GTO? Kilowatt hour. Theoretically, you, you should get permission, but the, 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 the gentleman from SA Power suggested that you could probably get it connected. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, on that, uh, on that particular topic, have you got anything in writing on that topic? Have I got it in writing? Yeah, because every time I've contacted them, uh, yeah, because I was part of. Um, I was part of a trial with um, on J tariff with a few other people, but then they chopped that out, stopped it. So there's no hope for anyone else to do. Well, in your electricity, just to the any other questions? Yes? Oh yeah, well J-Tariff only comes on like half past ten to half past six or something. Yeah, but at the moment it's half past ten. No. That's always during the night. Other states have different Sorry? Different than other states, oh, they've got time of time of day uh, tariffs and stuff. Yeah. Presumably, when you turn it on, if it's outside of that time, it's just not charging until until uh, ten o'clock or. Whatever. Yeah, ten thirty. I, I have it plugged in and turned on, all ready to go, and it just when when J tariff starts up, it just starts charging. Yeah. So you've got to have a charge that will do that. You can't. You, you know. You don't have, you can't have anything that needs you to push a switch at the same time oh. to start it. It's got to be self-starting. But uh, it seems to work well. But with my two two cars now being plugged in, I'm organising. I've got a timer set up so that um, one car gets charged, and then when the t timer gets to three hours, the relay changes over to the other car, so I can charge the electric car and the Prius all on the same night. That's not all wired up yet. At the moment, I, if I want to do both cars, I'd do one on J tariff and one on normal tariff. But, yeah. If there's no more questions, oh, one What's more question. One for your car. Fifteen thousand. <laughs> Cost over twenty thousand to to convert, and another four thousand to paint. So that's all. Thank you very much.